the number one thing we have to do to, in this world is to get people to move more. So if that's what's happening, I think that's good. It's the same with exercise too, right? I think people think, oh, if I don't start young and I don't start early, that it's too late for me with exercise. All the latest research with um, medical experts will tell you that that is absolutely not true and that we can get these huge benefits and truly interrupt the negative changes that are coming for our bodies and minds cognitively, physically, um, with a new exercise program. Welcome to the Hard Way Podcast with Joe DeSena, founder and CEO of Spartan Races. We're teaching you how to overcome your obstacles in your life the same way we teach our 10 million plus Spartans to overcome obstacles on the course. With insight from the smartest, most accomplished experts from every corner of the world. Get ready to elevate your life today. Joe DeSena here, CEO and founder of Spartan and host of the Hard Way Podcast. I got a great friend, great superwoman, I refer to her as, Gwendolyn Bounds. She's written an amazing book. Well, you've been writing your whole life. I mean, this book is just an extension of the way you think about life. Yes, yes it is. Thanks, Joe. Um, and thanks for that superwoman intro. The check is definitely in the mail to you. You can create a new obstacle with that. Uh, the, the name of the book is Not Too Late, The Power of Pushing Limits at Any Age. I think this is something you really can identify with. It's something you espouse with your community. And, you know, we are we live in a world where we are bombarded by marketing, pushing hacks and shortcuts to find health and wellness and happiness. You know, five-minute workouts, a magic supplement or a pill, the quick fix of dopamine hits on social media. And I witnessed this evolution of the business world and marketing as a reporter and editor at the Wall Street Journal for 20 years. We're cutting corners in this world to seek well-being. It's not working. Happiness is going down in America. And my book, Not Too Late, offers a pretty starkly different prescription for well-being as we age, which is this. Go down the long road of mastering something hard and new that you love. And my book is both a personal story um, chronicling my own highly unlikely journey to become a later in life athlete in the sport of obstacle course racing, which I think you know a little something about. It's also a scientifically backed um, and research heavy guide with tools and tactics to help anybody on their own quest, no matter what age they are, Joe. Well, you look like you're 18. So like- Oh, this, like this is just, this is getting better and better. <laughs> I'm going to stay on forever. We're never, we're never hanging up. When is too late? Is it never too late? You know, it's interesting because I can't, I actually thought about the title Never Too Late versus Not Too Late. I don't know. You know, I met a woman reporting this book who's 83. Her nickname is Muddy Mildred. She lives in Missouri. She's one of the oldest women, if not the oldest woman, to have ever run um, a Tough Mudder. And when I talked to her, like she just had a will to live. And this will to live, I think, is something we need to push on until the day we die. There's a woman named Becca Levy. She works at Yale. She's done some amazing research about our perceptions on aging. And this has just really stayed with me. She found people with positive perceptions about aging live 7.5 years longer than people who don't have positive perceptions of aging. That's a significant amount. I'll take that 7.5, right? And I have truly come to believe that part of will to live is waking up in the morning and having something hard to pursue, something hard to new, hard and new to learn and master, even if you never reach the level of expert, right? So I don't think it's ever too late. At least I'm going to hope that's not the case for me. No, I, I, I've seen some studies. I'm sure you looked at them where they've changed the um, programming for an elderly group of people. So they see old photos where they were young, they listen to music when they were young, and all of a sudden they start acting young. It's the same with exercise too, right? I think people think, oh, if I don't start young and I don't start early, that it's too late for me with exercise. All the latest research with um, medical experts will tell you that that is absolutely not true and that we can get these huge benefits and truly interrupt the negative changes that are coming for our bodies and minds cognitively, physically, um, with a new exercise program. I saw a study about how people who were elderly and frail were put on a strength training program and also given a, a protein supplement. And they put on nearly three pounds of lean mass over the course of six months. Now that is pretty heartening, right? So if you're frail and elderly, if you think, well, I'm just middle-aged, you got no excuse not to start um, start trying on your end. You've been uh, moseying on around our, our, or racing around our community, it sounds like, for quite some time. Have you bumped into a lot of elderly along the way? 
Where they bumped into me as they passed me on the course. Um, you know, I'm amazed. So I'm in the 50 to 54 age group competitive bracket. That's what I race in. I just came back from Big Bear, which is one of your hard- hardest courses. Um, I was it was brutal. I was lucky enough to take first in that race coming down. But I saw people who are in age groups older than I am um, who were faster. Right? There are people who are up in the 60 plus um, age who are just crushing it on that course. Um, It's a little bit self-selecting, right? Anybody who's racing competitively at that age is taking care of themselves. But it gives me a lot of heart, like when I stand there on those age group podium awards and watch people of that age get up there and listen to those times. And that's that's a huge inspiration. And a lot of these people probably started late like I did. I I was a skinny, scrawny kid growing up. My nickname was Bones. I was last pick for sports teams. I didn't even start be competing athletically until I discovered Spartan through a random Google search after a cocktail party one night. Um, and that set me off on this rabbit hole journey where I couldn't do one pull up. Um, and now I've completed 50 races. I've been on the podium almost 20 times and I've raced in Abu Dhabi at the world championship and, um, and Lake Tahoe. And it's been life changing. I don't know what aging would be like if I hadn't discovered something hard and new like this. Um, it would be very different. Well, let's say there were no health benefits. Let's say you were out doing all these events, and obviously this sounds like a paid commercial. You and I talk like, but it's not. This I should not- say, as I'm a journalist, I am not paid by Spartan, and I have never talked to Joe Desena before today. Yeah, so so it is. It's almost like a, I'm on candid camera or something. But <laughs> let let's just. Um, assume there were no health benefits. Why else is it interesting to you? I'm, I'm curious, like what, yeah. what is it about the sport that's interesting? I work in the business world, right? I'm a leader. Um, I'm, a, I'm now a vice president at a, at a, a startup media company. Um, there are a lot of leadership lessons for me to be learned on the course with those obstacles, right? You think about, you come up to a spear throw and you got one shot. So that's like your one pitch you get, like the elevator pitch you get. You got to practice. You got to get your breathing under control. You cannot take anything for granted. The spear throw is, it's a game changer. And so people have to be ready for that kind of pressure in the, in the business world and in life in general. I love there's a, there for people who are not obstacle course races, there are these obstacles called heavy carries, right? You're carrying big, heavy sandbags or buckets of rocks up and down mountains I find the willpower, the determination, and the grit I see in people's faces of all body shapes and sizes going up and down that, I think that's a lesson for life as well, um, because we are all going to have to carry have something heavier in our life than we thought we were going to at some point. Um, and in my book, I have these chapters about the obstacles where there are metaphors for life. And we all know what it's like, right? You know, somebody you love gets sick. Um, you go through a divorce. You've got a burden heavier that you've got to put one foot in front of the other and just keep going until it's done. Um, So that I think, you know, walls, walls are the price of entry to get into a race is to climb over a four foot wall. And that's not going to be the last wall you face, right? You're going to get a six foot wall. Maybe you're going to get an eight foot wall. That is almost like the barrier to starting anything new, the barrier in front of you saying, I'm too old for this, right? I'm already fully baked as a human being. I know what I'm good at. I'm going to stick with what I'm competent at. Like you got to get over that wall. And that to me, that those the metaphors of racing and the metaphors of the obstacles, aside from the physical side, those have really resonated with me as a leader, to be honest with you, Joe. How about um, kind of a setup, but how about the community? I have friends, like it's it's almost like a third place. So they talk about the first place being home and the second place being work. And we used to have you know, bars and pubs and churches that were kind of a third place. I think of these race venues as a third place. Um, You come in and it's like your own family in a different way. Um, People you see and you know just by how they perform on that day to some degree, or you maybe you follow them on social media. But there are people I see on the course who'll come running down like past me and they'll just give me a pat on the back when I'm like, you know, left my lung back up on the mountain and I'm just sort of thinking like, why am I out here doing this? And I hear that. And they keep me going and we keep in touch. These are people I never would have met otherwise. I find the fact that people cheer each other on in these races, even in the competitive heats, like you got this, keep going a little bit further. It's a really powerful thing. And I'll tell you something I love to do, which is after I will run a competitive um, age group heat, I like to go back out and run the open race. I love to find somebody who's out there for the first time. 
And I know what they feel when they come over a wall the first time, right? I know when you do something and you think you couldn't do it, that community is incredibly powerful. Um, and, you know, I think you can find that in sports in general, but um, obstacle course racing is what I know. And that's what I found there. And, and do you think, I'm sorry, I'm having so much fun with this. It's, it, this is unbelievable that I found you. Am I crazy for expanding the business beyond obstacle racing and having trail races and functional fitness DECA and hiking? You could be as negative or, or as on whatever. Just tell me, like, is that a crazy idea? It's a great question. You know, I'll put on, I've got a, I got two hats for you, right? I'm going to give you my business reporter hat and I'll give you my, my racer hat. I don't know. I haven't seen your PNL. I don't know, like, if you've expanded so much that it's hard to keep up and keep all of those different um, franchises going. I do think, though, the power of finding something for everybody, you can get them into something physical, right? Like, if you're doing something like a DECA fit, right, where you're more indoors and it's more regimented and you know, and that works for you, great. I got no issues with that. It's like people who make fun of pickleball who play tennis. I'm like, if something gets you out and moving, I think that's a good thing. You know, I think the thing you have to watch, I mean, and again, you asked me, so I'm going to answer is like, if you have too much um, diversity or overextension, right? What what happens to a franchise? Like, but, you know, we'll see how that goes. Um, and I think, look, at least there are more things to get more people moving. Um, and that's just so important. Like every expert I talked to in my book, Not Too Late, would say the number one thing we have to do to, in this world is to get people to move more. So if that's what's happening, I think that's good. I mean, at the end of the day, for me, it's not about money at all. Unfortunately, companies require you know money to, to operate. That's the, that's the lubricant. I get so much excitement out of having this conversation with a random person, you, where this was, you know, transformed your life in some way. And then you transformed others like, like that's my payment. And so it doesn't always come with obstacles. There are people that just, like you said, they're yeah. going to get moving on a trail. They're going to yeah. get moving, uh, whatever. So that's, that's why I do it. Um, I'm sure you know it, the, the pandemic was an absolute disaster for us. Yeah. The fact that we survived as an entity and you were, you, you were a journalist for wall street journal. So you'd get this, like, we should not exist. The Wall Street Journal actually called us. I don't know if you know this last summer, last August, called me to write an article for the cover of the bankruptcy section. They heard I wasn't paying my bills and I probably wasn't going to make it. Yeah. And I remember receiving the text. I got a text first of who it was, the journalist, what they were going to do. And I could basically comply and right, you know the game. And and I just thought, wow, what good is that for humanity? Like, why, how does that help? that's not going to give confidence to the next Gwendolyn that wants to sign up for a race. She doesn't know if we're going to exist. Yeah. And, and I, I remember that, you know, when it's darkest in a business is usually, or in life in general, any part of your life, when it's darkest, the naysayers usually show up right about then to really like make it just a little harder. And somehow I got through the interview and somehow we got through the next, you know, 12, 15 months. And for whatever reason, and I actually would have bet against myself for whatever reason, Gwen, the, the business is on fire right now. Like people are coming out in droves. We're seeing numbers in some cases better than 2019, you know, better than pre pandemic. So maybe what's happened, you tell me is they're not in the office. They're not as connected. They're staring at screens more. Maybe this is like you said, the third rail, right? The, like this is, this is it. It's interesting, right? When I was at the journal, I covered entrepreneurship um, and, you know, I saw a lot of who made it and who didn't. Um, the strength of a brand is often, and also the, I think the strength of the, uh, obviously the strength of the founder, but the people who work there in the toughest of times, like that often will tip the scales one way or the other. But, you know, you watched, I was part of the community who didn't have a bell to ring, right? During that time. That was it, the moment, it actually was a turning point for me in the pandemic because you really learn what your motivation is, right? It's pretty easy to get somebody up off the couch to go run a 5K if you give them, you know, $10,000 $10, or, you know, right? Like, but they're not going to go run it again if you're not going to give them any more money. So what is intrinsic motivation versus extrinsic motivation? And for me, like the intrinsic motivation of having to sort of stay in shape when there were no races, there was no bell to ring. And I missed that community. I loved watching the memes of people doing spear throws with their toothbrush toss, right? Or they would take their dog and put them over their shoulder and do the sandbag carry up and down the stairs. I mean, that's community. And so I invest in that, but 
I'm not embarrassed to say this. Like I staged, I live in the country out here. I staged mock races by myself on my dirt road alone where I would time myself and I would say, you know, what is your profession? And it would be my lone voice, you know, aru, aru, aru with the like squirrels and the like looking at me like I'm nuts in the trees. And then I would take off, I'd run, I'd put an old finisher medal around my neck if I thought I did a good job and I'd drink a fit, you know, and I just did that right to get through, but that's community and that's part of the brand. Um, and I think too, you know, when you're thinking about a brand sort of moving forward, like you're saying, why are so many people doing it now? You sat inside alone for a really long time, right? Staring and sitting at your, st- sitting and staring at your screens. And now like this ability to be out with people and do something and move. I remember my first race back in Ohio and I think it's the, you've heard of the concept of flow, right? It's the first time I ever felt physical flow in my life. Just this crush of sweating with other people. Like it was, and it's the first time I ever got a gold medal was that race right after um, the pandemic. And it just was being back with people. So I think you're right. And I think people are gravitating to things they can do together more. uh, And I think physicality is going to be a part of it as well. You're awesome. Well, did you tell me where, where do you live? Where are you physically located right now? I'm in the Hudson Valley in New York in Garrison, New York. So it's about 50 miles. You guys do a uh, um, race in Bethel, um, yeah, which is not too Bethel. far. Yeah. So bad news for you is I need you in Vermont uh, for the death race. <laughs> the and summer the reason, death race. Yes. The reason I need you there is uh, when I first started this company, this business 25 years ago, I couldn't get people to come out and do these things. So I would lie to them. This was before social media. I would say, oh, it's a barbecue weekend on my farm. So I tricked, I tricked a lot of people into coming out to the death race this summer coming up. And they think there's going to be like a, you know, a conference (laughs) on the farm. And I would love to have you out there where you could help me lead those new victims. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I think it'd be, I think it'd be a lot of fun. And you probably, I assume you've never seen the death race. You've never come out. I haven't. I'd love to do it, honestly. I mean, uh, you know, I mentioned the death race in the book um, and I know it's where everything began. You know, I've been interested in seeing it and like dipping my toe in it. So um, if we can make it work, let's do it. How do people find you, by the way? People can go to GwendolynBounds.com. Um, you can find me there. You can find all my social media handles. The book um, is available for ordering now, um, both hard copy, digital. I read the book myself. That is an endurance race in itself, Joe, is reading your own book, as I'm sure you probably know. Um, your voice is shot by the end of it, but that's it's available in, all, in audio too. So what we'll do, Gwendolyn, is why don't you reach out to your large family of followers and friends and everybody you know, and they'll all race on us, no charge, as long as they buy the book. So <laughs> okay. um, you reach out to them, you collect their emails, honor system, tell me what you need, and and maybe you can get a big community to come out and do a race with you all in the name of, of movement and this book. Yeah, that'd be awesome. I'd love to get people who've never done it before. I got my 76-year-old father to run a Spartan race with me in Asheville, North Carolina. He crushed crushed it. He crushed the Herc hoist. He was amazing. There's an 80, I was just told there's an 82 year old that's done 200 of of our events. Yeah. Isn't that amazing? It's it's unbelievable. I mean, there's a 90 something year old World War II vet. Like there's some amazing people out there. Marla, I don't know if you know Marla, I got to connect you with her. She's 70 something. One day I saw her and she had a black eye. And I said, Marla, what happened? (laughs) And she's like, oh, I just, I was doing your race last week. I fell down a mountain. <laughs> oh my God. Well, I mean, my arm is like, you can see right here, the bruises, this is all from the wall at Big Bear. So I, I, I the woman who was 80 something, I mentioned you did Tough Mudder. I was like, what advice do you have for me on like on the bar? And she's like, on the barbed wire crawl, you got to stay low enough to not get your hair caught. And I'm like, good advice. Look, it sounds like, look, you weren't an athlete. You were probably, I assume, somewhat stuck. Most people, that's what they say. Oh, I'm in my routine. I'm too old. I'm not in shape. What, what, how do you get started? What would you say? I was trapped in inertia, right? Like I had this, like many people, I think, Joe, I had this carefully created life of all the things I'd chosen, but they had become, there's a sameness that was emerging to the days, right? A wake up, you know, rinse, repeat kind of thing. And, um, you know, my story in this book even though OC uh, obstacle course racing is at the core of it, 
It's not about that, right? My story is a universal one about somebody trying to make the most of the time that is left to them. Left to them. And so I think for people, there's a question we stop asking ourselves, and this is actually how I got started on the road to obstacle course racing. I was at a dinner party. There was an old man well into his gin who was asking the host, little kid, little girl, what do you want to be when you grow up? What do you want to be when you grow up? She was rattling off all these amazing things, right? And I was listening to her and he was regretting he had ever asked the question. I woke up the next morning completely unsettled by that question because I realized I had stopped asking myself that question. I think we all stop asking ourselves that question at some point. Like, again, we think we're fully baked and that this is what I'm good at and this is what I'm not good at. And that's when I went and Googled, what are the hardest things you can do? And that's how I literally discovered this, went down the rabbit hole and discovered what Spartan racing is. I think if we keep asking ourselves this question, what do I want to be when I grow up? Um, I think that's one of the ways that people can get started. I think too, you need to be okay looking foolish, right? We get older and we think, oh, you know, I'm supposed to be wise and I'm supposed to be good at everything. And we gravitate toward those things we're good at. Boy, do I look dumb out in my yard crawling around on middle-aged limbs, right? And trying to do a bear crawl in the frozen ground. I think no matter what you do, be okay you're going to be a fly fisherman. You're going to get your line wrapped in the tree a couple of times. You want to be a diver. You're going to do belly flops. That's okay. And the minute you can get past that, you're going to be a lot further down the road. There's a psychologist you may have heard of named Carol Dweck. She's at Stanford. She talks a lot about, right, the growth mindset. There's a Chicago school she often cites where they give a grade of not yet if someone has messed up, has failed. I love that. Not yet, right? I am, I'm not an artist yet. I'm not a singer yet. I'm not, for me, I've had to, I have to say this to myself like all the time still. I'm not an athlete yet. And that's a very powerful turning point for people to think that. Um, so those are a few of the things I would say. I'd love to know what you think, Joe. I was just thinking you are a Spartan, Gwendolyn. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's funny you say, so I'll tell you one more thing. I got diagnosed with melanoma, skin cancer, um, right after I was, had done my second race. I was very lucky. They called it early. I had to go into surgery. They took out a chunk of my leg um, and sewed it back together. I woke up, you know, from the anesthesia and I'm like, you know, they're giving me graham crackers. They're all spilling down my face and they bring um, the, a wheelchair to me. I'd only done two races at that point. And I, something in the loopy anesthesia of my mind said, I'm going to walk out of here because a Spartan would walk out of here. I, I'd done two races. I didn't even know, but that was how sort of deep the identity became. And that the ability to say that, you know, it got me through some very hard times after that, right? With the diagnosis and like the fear of like, what's next? Am I going to die? Right. You know, all of the anxiety around that. And so I think for people to find something like that, they can hold on to um, because life is going to throw you a bunch of curveballs. Life is going to throw you hard things. If you have something that you're working toward all the time and that you want to be a part of and that excites you, that sort of not yet mentality is going to really be powerful. Who knew, right? I mean, my mom, my mom back in the seventies found the yogi. I don't know if you know the story. She was, yeah. looking, she was looking to save her mom. And she found this yogi that believed in, you know, meditation, yoga, becoming a vegan and long distance running. And so along the way, I watched my mom change all these people's lives because she then passed that on. And so I don't know what would have happened had that, had that not happened. Right. Like right. I, I talked to people all day, every day, and probably you do too, that have not been bit by this bug and have not truly lived, or at least from my perspective, your perspective. And boy, I wish they were outside more, you know, dancing yeah. in the rain or climbing a mountain or whatever that might be. It's so freeing to get muddy and dirty. Yeah. I remember the first time, like I was just in a wet in, at West Point at a race, and I'm like, I don't know if I was 47 at the time. Like I'm a 47 year old woman, like crawling through the mud, like on a military facility. That like you cannot be bored, right? Chronic boredom is a health hazard. Pretty hard to be bored when you're sort of all, like crawling through the mud, throwing spears and climbing ropes. And even if you're not going to do that. I think finding something like it, I think it needs to be hard because I think the joy comes when you have pushed yourself beyond what you think you can do. And we take the easy way out too much. Um, 
And so I would really encourage for people to encourage people to look for something where it's just not a shoe in the first time you do it, right? You got to keep coming back. My biggest failures in racing have been the things that taught me the most, right? First race I had a DNF in was like, you know, I don't think I'd ever quit anything in my life to that point, Joe. Um, and so to get back up and show back up at my gym the next day and be the only one without a finisher t-shirt was like not getting invited to the prom, right? But I learned from that. I found my edges and equalizers as somebody who's older. You know, when you're older, you have to use crystallized intelligence, your wisdom to be better at what you're doing. You know, I got stung by a bunch of wasps during a race, but I knew to pack wet mud in my racing tights. And that got me through the last eight miles of that race. Um, and so I think people can lean on that crystallized intelligence as they age and in any discipline that can help them excel. Well, here's the really good news from this interview. I now know that if I get hit by a bus, we have Gwendolyn to step in and be the face <laughs> of the brand. So any, it, any, any time, any time, Joe, I am, uh, look, you know, I'm a journalist, but I will tell you personally, um, you know, my life would be very different. Um, and I am, I am just an example of one. I see the people out there on that course. Um, I see their faces. I see what happens when they cross the finish line. I thought my race, I thought I was going to be a one and done racer. I thought I'd do my first race at City Field, get that finisher t-shirt, It'd be my, you know, fashion red sports car on the day when things seem bleak. And, you know, um, I used to kind of think like, what's this Spartan line? You'll know at the finish line, right? I was like, what does that really mean? And when I went through that gauntlet at City Field and I crossed that finish line, I knew something just like chemically changed. And so uh, I want that for more people, um, whether it's this or something else. But I think there's a lot to be said for this because of how it prepares you for life and the ways you need to move for life. I just flew back on a plane. Woman couldn't put her own small bag into the overhead bin. She needed me to do it. And it wasn't even very heavy. She looked at me and she said, this is the hardest part of traveling. I thought, this is what we've come to. But all the movements that you have to do in obstacle course racing are so about making you fit for the daily tasks of life and aging. Can you pick up that bag of mulch at the Home Depot, right? And not have to ask for help. Can you get into your airline seat without a middle-aged groan and squeezing in there? You know, so um, I'm a big believer that people will find a lot, whether it's through obstacle course racing or just movement in general that prepares them to be what I call fit for life. Doesn't it, one, one, I got another question. Doesn't it suck? Because uh, you came from the Wall Street Journal. I was on Wall Street for quite some time as well. There's companies out there that are that are literally doing the opposite, that are selling yeah. garbage to people. And you started yeah. the conversation with the five minute out. Like, I just don't know. I, I, yeah, I just don't know how you get excited about that. I yeah. know everybody's got to put food on the table, but that's just, it's the opposite of what we're talking about. I think sometimes you fill more of your time with these wasted things of hacks, right? And you're spending more time making your lists and your fancy apps and um, trying to sort of find, the, again, the magic bullet. And all that time, you could have just been doing one thing really good for yourself, one simple thing each day. Life is a lot about, it's not, we think everything turn our life turns on the big choices, but it really turns on the small little choices we make each day, right? Do I reach for that extra bagel, right? Do I have this, the second glass of wine at the park? Like all of those small things actually can be very easy decisions that you can make throughout the day that don't require a major investment. And I also think it doesn't have to be expensive, right? I learned, I didn't join a gym to do this. I went to the local playground, right? I got on monkey bars with kids teaching me how to do monkey bars while their parents watched. It was free. I went to the local track. It was free. I carried a rock around my property. It was free. So we make things harder than, it do, than, than they need to be, but we also rely too many, too much on things that are crutches, right? Like what you're saying, Joe, these hacks. And those become busy, busy, busy things. And then we're not focusing on the one are two essential things that will actually truly make us happy. And there's a lot in the book I talk about how to sort of bank your time to focus on what's essential and what really matters. Um, and I think that's something that our societies, particularly with social media, um, has, has not allowed us to do in the last 10 years. You're amazing. You made me happy today. This was great. 
selfishly my favorite podcast ever. <laughs> well, a lot of the, you know what? This will probably be the most fun podcast in the book tour for me too, because I get to talk to somebody who, um, you know, founded something very special and understands it. Thank you. 